the Miners of Mountain Ridge High School in Frostburg, Maryland have accumulated 17 state championships in the seven years since the school's opening in 2007. Such incredible success, even after moving into 2A qualifications, could not possibly be achieved without a long history of dedication. Here is that story, a long list of personal triumphs, community support, and team perseverance. This story begins in the 1950s, when Western Allegheny County played host to five distinctive athletic programs, Barton, Central, Bruce, Mount Savage, and Bell. With the shrinking of industrial America, our beloved small communities have begun to lose population. The Barton Braves and Central Tigers consolidated in 1954 to become the Black Knights of Valley High School. A high school built in Westernport in 1959 became the Bruce Bulldogs, but was absorbed into Valley High School 30 years later, ending the legendary Little Brown Jug tradition. Two years after the consolidation, the students of what was then known as Valley voted to adopt a new, unifying name, Westmar High School. In 2001, Mount Savage was absorbed in the Bell, both of which have been untouched by consolidation for decades. Finally, in 2007, Bella and Westmar High Schools joined forces to become the athletic powerhouse that we know today, the Mount Ridge Miners. Every year in mid-August, doors are unlocked and school parking lots begin to fill. School won't be in session for another month, but the student athletes are bursting at the seams to get started. As a matter of fact, last year's training never really ended. Athletes have been lifting, running, dribbling, and serving for months because, as 2004 state champion Madison Ofstein said, the summer before makes the state champion. This ceaseless training allows for football, volleyball, cross country, golf, fall tennis, and soccer players to approach the fall season with poise and power. Let the games begin. No collection of high school memories would be complete without chilly autumn nights in the football stadium. The fuzziest blanket, warm mittens, tons of friends, and months of halftime show preparation all come together to create a community event like no other. Of course, these cherished nights become even better when centered around an incredibly successful athletic program, which has been forged after decades of rival schools fighting for the Little Brown Jug, all collaborating into Mountain Ridge High School. I'd been to a state championship about four years before that as an assistant coach to Tom Harmon, who won the first ever, Valley won the first ever state championship game ever played in the state of Maryland. That was the first year they introduced it. We played Valley, being we played the first game, and Coach Harmon won it. And I thought that for him, that had to be a phenomenal uh, accomplishment. Mike Lewis, a running back and linebacker for Valley High School's football team, refers back to the state championship game and the intense season his team had. The state championship game um, was one that was cold. It was cold and icy. Nobody had on any really winter gear because we were kind of used to that. And I can remember the other team coming down. Some of the players even had toboggans on under their helmets and, and it was like, oh. It was going to be a game for them because it was cold. Uh, I don't think anybody believed we would do it. <laughs> That's when the, when the year began, and it came down to one of those point things. And uh, we won the last game when we had to win in the regular season. It got us into the playoffs. We went down to play Smithsburg, who had an All-American uh, tackle. We beat them, come home, and then went back uh, to play Snow Hill. And uh, that really wasn't much of a game at all. We, we really, <laughs> really won that one. But it was a great season. Uh, Doc Miles, he was the team physician. He was a smoker and he'd be smoking on the sidelines. He always wore cowboy boots and he had a cowboy hat. And uh, we were playing Southern. I come running through the line, I hit the linebacker and spun off. The helmets were different then. A lot of things were just plastic. And when I turned around, Liller, a player from uh, Southern, hit me with his helmet right in my face mask. And my face mask shattered. And pieces of it st stuck in me. And um, of course, my home was broke, so I had to go off, and, uh, and I was bleeding, and uh, went over to Doc Miles, and he looked at me, and come over, and he's got to get, this is a great picture, he's got his boots on, he's got this big cowboy hat on, he's got a cigarette in the corner of his mouth, 
and he's got his tweezers out and he's pulling these pieces of plastic out of me. And, I'm, and then he pulls this one piece out of here and he gets it, and it's about that long. And he says, you know, he says, if that would have been over about another sixteenth of an inch, he said, you'd be dead. Threw his cigarette on the ground, looked around and said, somebody get Lewis a helmet. And right back, you know, I had like a turtleneck of gauze around my, around my neck. And it was, it's a wonder they didn't kill us. I mean, it's... John Davis, football player for Frostburg State University, refers back to one football game in which he suffered an injury, implying the difference in the emphasis on safety and sports at the time. The game, in the game, I was playing middle linebacker and I tackled a guy coming through and they, there was a polyp and I had my right calf cut vertically with a razor somehow and uh, they never did find the razor and I ended up in the hospital uh, being sewn up and about 20 minutes later another player by the name of Bill Graves also got cut the same way and they stopped the game a number of times but never did find the, the razor and uh, I guess that's my claim to fame on the football team, I got cut, you know. But it was interesting because two weeks later I was playing again, so it was really... Uh... Adam Patterson, star quarterback for Bell High School, reflects on receiving awards for his successful season. I don't know, I didn't, I didn't place a whole bunch of value on it, to be honest with you, because um, I know others thought it was a big deal, but I, I played the sport because I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed preparing for it. And so usually with anything, if, if you're going to dedicate yourself and, and you're going to work hard, typically success follows. Um, but I wasn't doing it for the awards or the recognition. We had such a good group of kids. Um, I had classmates and stuff that we had played for years and years and years together. And we were a very I mean, cohesive type group and got along well and had a good time. and so. A lot of times when I hear kids complain about how they don't like practicing, practicing stinks, I don't want to prepare for football, um, I, I have a hard time relating. And, and, and even when I look back at some of my, my friends that were in sports with me at the time, I don't remember any of us kind of you know, I mean, griping about it and complaining. I, I think it was, we looked at it as it was fun, as something for us to do. And here comes Frost! Bill Patterson, who was the head coach of Bell's state finalist team in 1993, reflects on one of his coaching memories. Hey, warm up the bus, baby. We're going to College Park. <laughs> so we would have our coaches' meetings on Saturday morning, and we'd meet out in the old athletic building. So there was a guy that lived locally here. He still lives there. And he was he exercised and walked around the, the stadium much like you walk around the school now. And he would sort of time it just right on Saturday mornings. Whenever I'd be going down there to meet with the coaches, he would be walking around the school. And he always sort of had it timed right, right about the time I got out of my car and started down in there. And, and one particular Saturday morning, I always remember he stopped me and he said, Coach, you know, he said, I, I'd like to ask you a question. And I said, well, sure, what would that be? And then he referred to the previous Friday night game. He said, well, you know, remember last night, he said, um, when you guys were down there on the two-yard line and, and um, you know, everything was on literally a few seconds to go. It was going to be determined whether you won the game or not. And uh, the way it worked out, we'd lost the game. And anyways, he said, you know that one particular play you ran? He said, uh, you know, if I were you, he said, I would have I would have ran this other play. And uh, I remember saying to him, I said, well, you know, after thinking about it all night and this morning yet, you're right, I'd have probably ran your play. I said, but last night I only had 25 seconds to decide. Title IX became law in 1972 in Maryland, which prohibited the discrimination on the basis of sex in schools, including their athletic programs. This was a major victory for women in the United States. Many athletic programs were started for young girls in this area by women such as Joan Fitzpatrick and Joanne Nichol. These programs changed sports in the area forever. I introduced what was called a par, par volleyball at that time and that was the, the hitting, the, the smashing. Um, I went to several clinics and um, so I introduced the county to 
um, volleyball as, as you know it to, today. Um, Title IX and uh, ladies my age worked for that all over the country so that the girls would have equal opportunities. And I had a team at Mount Savage who were 15 and 0, and they didn't have any place to go because uh, uh, they won the county championship, but there weren't any state championships for them. I always thought they it was bad that they didn't get to do that because I think they had if they'd had the opportunity they could have gone all the way. Before this, all of our games were played after school, and basically after school when the boys had a away or home game. That way then the gym was open. That was the only time. Any other time, whenever we had practices, we either had to wait until they were playing other games and the gym was available, or we would come in uh, later on in the night. Today's high school volleyball is a product of the foundations laid by the area's early volleyball coaches, such as Joanne Nickel. Half of the half of the kids were on, on volleyball were on the basketball team, uh, and they they won that in '79, um, and it was um, it was fantastic. Um, I can't. Uh, I can't really describe uh, the feeling that I had when they won because the, the state champion was two years in a row, um, we upset them. And um, it was a, quite a thrill. I have five uh, volleyball finalists, which is the runner up, you know. Um, I, I, I did. 75, 77, 78, 81, and 86. And then in the volleyball, we won it in 79 and 82, and 83, and 97. D Blank, who was on the Mount Savage volleyball team under Coach Nickel, explains the behavior that was expected of the players by Mrs. Nickel and how leadership was inspired in their team, leading to success. Another thing about Mrs. Nick was when you went to any ball game, you looked like you were going to work. It was your job, and you dressed very, very professionally. You behaved very professionally. Um, one thing that I think that she taught us, and it's a simple little thing that gave us an edge in many ball games, was she taught us to be polite to the referees. When the when the referee handed us the ball, we would say thank you. <laughs> and if there was a call that could go one way or the other, it was amazing how often it went your way because. The other girls maybe were not so nice and didn't show the same level of respect. I remember going and, and winning the game that took us to the state championship game. And again, there was, that, there was that sense of calm that year. There was that sense of things were going to happen and everything was gonna fall into place. And um, there was confidence about that team and there was great leadership among that team. And um, again, you know, the, the fire trucks and the, till we got back to Mount Savage, there were cakes and parties and people invited us to their homes for uh, celebrations. Cross country is a very demanding, yet rewarding sport that builds character essential for life. It is a great example of where patience and perseverance may lead to success, which is relative and intrinsic for each person. Westmar High School was another school that excelled in cross country under the direction of coach Tom Dawson. This is most evident in individual champion Zach Bittinger in 1998 and Jennifer Patton in 2001. The year we won state, we only won one meet. The last one it was the only meet we won all year, but we kept getting closer and closer and closer. And we beat Southern. Southern had t-shirts and hats printed up six in a row and we beat them. They didn't get six in a row. Dennis Albright states his achievements in cross country. I was uh, a member of the 1974 state championship cross country team at Bell, and I was the individual state champion that year. It was Class C, which would be the equivalent of uh, uh, Class A now in Maryland. Uh, we were the small school 
division. Uh, I, we, like I said, we won the state championship that year. We have what is still the record in the state for the lowest score ever, because in cross country it's the lowest score possible. Mm -hmm. And we scored 18 points at the state meet, which is to this day is still the state record. Dan DeWitt, a cross country runner at Bell under coach Norm DeRosa, talks about the support he received from the ones around him. Fortunate enough to grow up with all of his kids. I knew him long before coming to Bell, even, even as a seventh grader. I grew up playing with his kids uh, when I was 10 or 11 years old. So, I mean, I, I knew him for a long time through soccer and, and other sports. And I talked to him very early on about my interest in doing both soccer and cross country. And he, he never discouraged me from, from either one, and which I appreciate a lot. Of, a lot of coaches will say their sport only or, or don't do anything else. And he was always very supportive. And coach was never really boastful or even really let on at all about the things that he accomplished. It's one thing when you have a coach who has read a book and tells you what you're supposed to do. It's another thing when the person's actually actually done it and had the success. So that that really that really helps you buy into the program. And he was he was very interested in us and not only as athletes but as as growing up as young men and women and it, it it really felt more like a like a brotherhood or a family as opposed to just a, a group of guys playing on the same team and that was really kind of facilitated by him. Norm DeRosa, who was the cross country coach at Bell High School and is also the cross country coach at Mountain Ridge High School, explains what a true champion is. Uh, you know, state championships are great. I mean, what an achievement. But, you know, sometimes a lot of those kids that stand out are just those kids that maybe had the greatest work ethic in the world, but they could never achieve that championship. Coach DeRosa explains through a personal experience how a sport can be more than a game. One of the most important events in my life, um, of course, has been my daughter, Katie. And um, as many people in the community know, uh, she passed away while running. Um, the day before she was to start uh, her cross country season at Bell High School in 1998, August 15th, 1998. Uh, she was, I can just see her saying, Dad, I'm just gonna go out for a little run. And I said, okay. And um, that just 10 minutes later, uh, you know, our whole life changed. But um, the community just had a fantastic support for us. But if I had to think of one thing that really influenced me a lot, you know, we had thousands of people come to the funeral home, but um, the coach uh, that I first coached with, Bill Patterson, he came to the funeral home and he whispered in my ear, he said, Norm, you have a lot to offer kids. Don't give it up. And um, that has stuck with me uh, just forever. And I think at that moment, it, it kind of, set my whole philosophy about how I was going to direct my family around all of this. Um, we were going to keep doing what we do. Um, I owe it to our kids. I owe it to my wife. So uh, I want to thank Bill for that. That was just a huge uh, shot in the arm that I needed at that time. And um, everything I do running wise, I think uh, that I try to do it to honor Katie. The Vicki Vi Dodson Memorial Leukemia Fund Golf Tournament was started by Albert James Villa in 1980 after tragically losing his daughter, Vicki, to leukemia. Eventually, his daughter, Linda Rando, started managing the event. She remembers one of the many successful tournaments she managed. Um, one year they had so many um, competitors that there were two and sometimes three teams of six now. Uh, it was a scrambler format and they would be stacked up on the tees waiting to go off and it took all day to play. <laughs> the 
the most famous celebrity we had was in 1985, and that was Neil Armstrong, of course, the first man to walk on the moon. He said he didn't hit a golf ball on the moon. He wasn't the first to hit a golf ball on the moon, but he said he got the course ready. When football programs had begun, soccer was already a major sport in the area. These athletes would constantly be on the soccer field, passing, scoring goals, honing their skills, and having fun. We played a lot of soccer on Sundays. The older guys in town wanted us to play football, but the guys who were working with soccer and our Sunday school teacher was a soccer guy. So we had to promise that we'd go to the soccer field and play soccer, like after church. And then in the afternoon, later in the afternoon, we got to play football. And of course, football was, you know, just sort of getting started in the Georgia Creek area. But so it was a soccer town. When the leaves turn brown and the temperature drops, the athletes are out on the field, shin guards on and ready to win. Mountain Ridge is a major competitor in the local area when it comes to soccer. Coach Nightingale refers to the battles these back-to-back -back championships were. Back-to-back -back state championships in 2010-2011, doing it in 2010, uh, we did that with a young team. And it was kind of unexpected. Uh, we got into a battle with Brunswick and uh, it was a classic battle, another epic battle. At that, at that level, it's going to be a one goal game. Connor Eberly, who was the head goalie and a key player in the state championship games, explains how his soccer career began and reflects on his memories of those state championships. I was a striker growing up and um, I got to Mountain Ridge and we didn't have a goalie, so I pulled the short straw on that one and played goalie. It was difficult at first. I didn't really know how to dive for the first two weeks of playing goalie. Um, but I grew into it quick and uh, picked up some skills. We started off that game, they, we had the wind not in our favor, so every ball they kicked was just coming down my way, closer and closer to the goal every time. And um, the first half I got a yellow card and had to get sent off the field for about two minutes, and um, that was pretty scary, because then Evan Deckers played goal I still don't know why, but he did. Um, I came back on the field and it was 0-0 at halftime. And um, I remember we were getting chewed out pretty good at halftime um, by our coaches. And we came out on the field. Uh, I'd say we were much more dominant the second half. And then we ended up getting a goal from Zach Norris with about 17 to go. and then. They came back on our end a good amount, and we held them off to the end, which was a pretty good experience. In western Allegheny County, when the last autumn leaves fall to the ground and the fall sports end, athletes move instantly from their fields and stadiums into every gym from Mount Savage to Westernport. Regardless of their sport and their previous successes, the athletes enter the winter season with renewed vigor and excitement. In addition to the desire for victory, another aspect of athletics that is carried over from the fall season to the winter season is the rich championship history of Western Allegheny County High Schools, with the list of state champions and record holders seemingly endless. However, Perhaps the greatest thing about the winter season is how it blends both traditional sports and those which are just now breaking into the realm of high school athletics. For decades, local boys and girls battled on the hardwood and wrestled to exhaustion, but only recently have indoor track and field and bocce ball joined the ranks of classic winter sports. Despite the gap in history between them, the unchanging aspect of winter sports in Western Allegheny County is their continuous success at the highest level. One of the most ancient forms of athletic competition, wrestling has an unrivaled local pedigree predating even the Maryland State Wrestling Tournament. For over 50 years, young men from Westernport to Frostburg have grappled and struggled their way to undefeated seasons, state championships, and Hall of Fame recognitions. If you think six minutes is a long time, 
you go on a mat with somebody for six minutes, it's an eternity. There's no break. You don't get to slough off, hustle them back on defense, or uh, kind of take a little suck air a little bit. Wrestling, you do that, you're on your back in a hurry. In 1967, Bruce High School principal, James H. White, approached Jim Smith with the proposition. The school's wrestling coach, Ken Pulling, had decided to resign, no longer willing to travel each day from his home in Cumberland. <laughs> I said, Mr. White, I've never seen a wrestling match. <laughs> but uh, I said, I had enough athletic experience that I could make sure they're in shape and in good condition and all that. But the kids will have to teach me wrestling. And uh, they did, and uh, we were undefeated. In need of immediate leadership, Mr. White and the athletic director, Forrest Boggs, handed the keys of the Bulldog Wrestling Program over to Smith. Inexperienced, but driven to succeed, Smith led the Bruce Matt men to new heights, going undefeated for the first time and capturing a fourth straight Potomac Valley Conference Championship. Well, Jim was, a, was an excellent coach. Uh, he should put us into the good shape that we got in to, uh, to be uh, you know, a little longer endurance and all that. He was just an overall good guy. One of the heroes of that historic team was sophomore Carl Duckworth. Wrestling at the 180-pound weight class, Duckworth was a young but vital contributor to Bruce's success, which he attributed to the Bulldogs' dedication and work ethic every day at practice. Uh, actually, at Bruce, there was uh, a set of steps that uh, the cafeteria was in the basement, basically, and there was a set of steps, and they'd come up to the next floor, and we'd do wind sprints up the steps. And after that, uh, you'd carry someone in, in your same weight class, you'd carry them up the steps, and we'd do that type thing. While Jim Smith was piloting Bruce to perfection, a young athlete at Bell was in the early stages of a wrestling career that would span several decades. Gary Davis would go on to become one of the most decorated high school coaches in the sports history, returning to Bell in 1973 and leading the Mountaineers to team state championships in 1982, 1983, 1984, and 1987. We used to wrestle in my driveways. We'd roll a wrestling mat out in the driveway in the summertime in 95 degree temperature, and we're out there wrestling. They probably thought we were crazy. Cars would go by, and I'm sure they were thinking those people were nuts, but I had kids that would do that year round. That's all they thought about. Gary motivated us. Yeah, we worked hard, he got us in condition, and motivated us, uh, you know, and he's definitely been uh, one of the biggest influences on my life. We had a boy named Albert, and uh, he was strong as a horse, and uh, he wasn't as talented, he wasn't as skilled as Mr. Davis, and uh, he, he found himself with about 10 seconds, 8 seconds left in the match. Albert was on top, and I thought, man, he's going he's gonna to reverse him and win the match. Albert was ahead by, one, by two. And I said, uh, I said, Albert, let him up. He looked at me, and he let Mr. Davis up. And then he looked, he said, what do I do now? I said, run. <laughs> I said, keep away from him. Just keep him away for eight seconds. And he did, and he, he won the match over Mr. Davis. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday. So it's once we get over the hump, and we started getting kids there that were athletes and competitors, we just dominated for a span of like 13 years there. We had like, at one span, 52 consecutive wins. After sharing the title in 82, Bell dominated the following season, breaking the record for the largest margin of victory by a wrestling team at the state tournament, claiming victory by 53 and a half points. They called us down to the floor at the end of the tournament. They had a trophy like that was four feet tall. They only had one trophy though and uh, we grabbed it. I said, that's going back with us. They're not taking it. We had a lot of kids that wrestled with their heart, that they lived, breathed, ate, drank wrestling. After a 16-year run, the legendary coach retired with a record of 166 wins, 26 losses, and one tie. Soon after his retirement, he was inducted into the Maryland High School Wrestling Hall of Fame. During his tenure at the head of the program, Bell Wrestling produced more individual state champions and place winners than any other Maryland high school in the 1980s. The Mountaineers' fourth state title of the 1980s proved their most dramatic, with Davis's son, Ryan, leading the team to a half-point victory. My father, Gary Davis, was the high school coach. Um, we basically 
born and bred into wrestling. My uncle wrestled, all my uncles wrestled, my cousins all wrestled. So I'm coming into this as, you know, we're, uh, we have to win up, you know, we're here now. He pushed me obviously, um, but, but you know, it was always to what I was capable of doing. If we had to cut weight for a match or for a tournament, um, you know, I'm 15 pounds overweight he would lose 15 pounds with me. So it's like, we're gonna do this together. Um, so I thought that was pretty, a, a pretty good thing uh, as far as that goes. Um, bad side, um, you can never take a day off. <laughs> it's, your father is the coach. I've, I've been away from high school for 25 years and you know, my best friends are the guys I wrestled with. It's like, that, that's what it's about and you know, Working with these young guys is, I'm trying to tell them that, you know, you're going to be with with this group of guys for the rest of your life. It's like, make the best of it, work together, make each other better. Despite the loss of one of high school wrestling's greatest coaches, Bell's success continued. In 1997, Alan Twig, one of Davis's former wrestlers, returned to the school to take over the program. Twig's first champion came only a few years later when Nick Durst won the championship in the 160 pound weight class in both 2001 and 2002. It was pretty enjoyable winning the states first year then repeating the second year. There's not too many people done it since Brian Davis before then and I was first one to accomplish it since then. It's hard to say that you know the fire department sign they had a congratulations on there actually had a fire truck back then only one I don't get as many as the teams now and then but yeah, it was good to see the community support. Uh, I had a lot of people come out for the home matches and everywhere, like small town, everyone knows who you are. Twig continued both his coaching tenure and his success after the formation of Mountain Ridge High School, producing several individual state championships in the school's first decade of existence. Among these early state champion minors is Adam Martz, currently a junior who has won state titles in two of his first three seasons at Mountain Ridge. My goal was I wanted to go undefeated and win states. When I made it to state championship, I, I, I knew I was one match away from beating my goal. And it just, I knew I had to do it. They had a ceremony where you walk out and I walk, I, we did the walk out and I was, I was fired up, I was ready to go. I was, but I'm right in the middle of the lineup because I'm 152, so I, either way I had about an hour, hour and a half wait before my match. I went out on the mat and we got in a heavy hand fighting right off the get go. And I was like, okay, here we go. And like, okay, I have to ride him out, get him tired, because he was a big kid, he dropped a lot of weight. I hand fought with him for until the end of the period. And then second period, I figured I wanted to get a lead right off the get go. And I got out from under him within, I think, like 15 seconds. And I kind of worked him a little bit, but I, I figured I wanted to put him back up on his feet because I could take him down. So I just rode him out to the, to the third. I didn't just want to release him. I wanted to ride him a little bit because third period, I knew, I knew he was going to break. I, I knew he was going to break. So I rode, him, I rode him out for probably a minute, and there was about 10 seconds left then. I, just, I was watching the clock. It felt like time just stopped. It was like... Five, four, three, two, one. And I stood up and I was just like, yes. And I, sh I showed a couple, couple emotions in the match. I mean, because I mean, I really wanted it. This sport is, you know, I, I don't knock on any other sport, but this one is unlike any other. It's like, it's you. And that's it. I mean, yes, I'm on a team, and I, my teammates make me better, and I make them better. But at the end of the day, it's you on the mat against one other person. So when you win, it's you won. Yeah, they help you get better as a team, but you're the one out there competing. When you lose, it's on you. You have nobody to blame but yourself. So this sport really will test what you have inside of you, you know, how far are you willing to go? Um, so I'll defend it till the day I die. 
the winter version of outdoor track and field, which dates back to the days of ancient Greece. Indoor track and field has a local history that, while at this point is only a spark, has the potential to grow into a blaze of success. After several brief but successful attempts at an indoor track program at Bell High School, which culminated in 2005 with star runner Dan DeWitt's state championship in the 3200 meter run with a time of 10 minutes and 20 seconds, a lack of funding and administrative support forced an indefinite end to indoor track at the school. That fall, several promising young athletes approached DeRosa with a desire to bring the sport back to Frostburg and compete for the first time as Mountain Ridge High School. I think my sophomore year I bugged my coach about it because um, I wasn't very good at basketball and I didn't want to play. And um, so I was like, Coach, we should really do an uh, indoor track program. And I know my mom pushed for it too. And we tried to, but it ended up not working out. So um, I ended up playing basketball. But then um, last year, my junior year, like at the end of my sophomore year, I was like, OK, Coach, we need to have this indoor program. And um, I think it's mostly Coach Drosa who is to credit for it and Mr. Davis. After months of debate, funding was secured to bring indoor track back to Allegheny for the first time in almost a decade. Due to a lack of indoor training space, runners were forced to run outside in the bitter Frostburg winter, giving the sport the local moniker, Winter Track. In only the program's second year, the Miners produced not one, but two state championship runners. Sophomore Molly Ofstein secured the state title in a 3200 meter run with a time of 11 minutes, three seconds. I stayed behind the leading girl for the first 15 laps. You have to run 16 for the two mile and indoor. And um, on the last lap, on the last like 300, I ended up passing her and winning. But I didn't like, I didn't think I had it in me going the last lap, like, I wasn't really planning on passing her, but she wasn't speeding up. Like, I was expecting her to speed up, but she didn't, and so I just took the chance. But um, I was so happy when Molly won. I, like, was crying. I was probably more excited for her to win than I was, but I knew because she won, I had to, I had to win, too, because... Yeah. That'd be awkward. <laughs> a few hours later, Princeton University-bound senior Madison Ofstein, Molly's older sister, won the 800-meter run with a time of 2 minutes, 18 seconds. Um, going into regionals, I definitely did not expect um, to win states. Uh, going into the last 50 meters, I was like, oh my gosh, this is four years. Four years of training to finally say I'm going to yeah. do it. One of the few unified sports featured at Mountain Ridge is bocce ball. Combining boys, girls, and students with special needs, bocce ball is a rewarding sport for everyone involved. In 2013, bocce ball won the state championship. On a 12-court arena, the bocce ball team strive to do their best and come out on top. It's definitely more fulfilling. I mean, if that's possible to be more fulfilling than two state championships. I mean, just seeing the joy it brings everyone there. It's an indescribable feeling. It's just really rewarding. Especially with the special and the special ed kids. I mean, they get to do something in school as a sport. It's considered a varsity sport and they get like a letter and a banquet and... It's, it's, re it's really fun to play with them because you know you're doing something good for them. You're helping them out to get more experience in like sports and that. The history of girls basketball in Western Allegheny County is one that is far older and richer than many people realize. The sport's local story begins with the high school girls basketball teams that played six on six and competed briefly in Allegheny County during the first part of the 20th century, decades before Title IX expanded girls sports in 1972. In these 1920s Western Maryland girl basketball leagues, the powerhouses were Bell High School in Frostburg and Central High School in Lonaconing. Central's Lady Tigers won 65 straight games during the 1922, 1923, and 1924 seasons 
eventually being upset by arch-rival Bell in the 1924 Western Maryland Invitational League Championship by a score of 36-35. The star of these great central teams was Mary Boyd Eichler, who on February 25, 1924, set the still-standing girls basketball world record for most points in a single game when she scored 156 against Ursuline Academy of Cumberland. Eichler's record-setting performance placed her among the greatest female basketball players of all time. Several decades later, after the passage of Title IX, girls basketball again became a force in the Western Maryland sports landscape. In 1977, under the direction of coach Joanne Nickel, the Mount Savage Lady Indians, including Dee Blank, won the Class C girls basketball title. Well, that was in Flintstone at the time, and uh, three, of us, three of us or four of us got together and we decided we were going to do basketball. Uh, but I used to shoot around uh, with a, another girl, and um, I guess that was the beginning. It is highly likely that Nichols' first basketball championship would have come earlier, but Maryland did not hold girls' basketball playoffs until 1973, leaving out an undefeated Lady Indian squad off the early 1970s. By winning the state title in 1977, Mount Savage opened the door for generations of female basketball players. In the early 1990s, recently formed Westmore High School became a state powerhouse in girls basketball. Coach Joan Fitzpatrick and player Don Sloan led the Lady Wildcats to several highly successful seasons in the 1990 and 1991 Class 1A state championships. Girls basketball, and that was all. And you got out of school at 3 o'clock. By the time you got down and dressed, it was 10 after. We had to get off the floor at 4 o'clock so the boys could come in. You see the difference now than what it was then? Out on the road, we had just had one little hoop, but I was the only girl that was out there playing. You'd get muddy, you <laughs> go hit the ball and off the road, and my mother said, look at you, a girl, all muddy. She didn't know it was going to be my lifetime work, did she? Between 1948 and 1981, Six different Western Allegheny County high schools won at least one state championship in boys basketball, with a total of 17 coming from the high schools that would eventually consolidate into Mountain Ridge. Due to the fact that in the 1940s and 50s, local high schools were in different classifications, some seasons saw multiple Allegheny County teams claim championships. Countless star players, infamous games, and epic rivalries have graced the gyms of Western Allegheny County. Bell won the Class B title in 1949, while future University of Maryland standout Don Moran led Bruce High School to Class C championships in both 1948 and 1949. And I played the next year, of course, as a senior, and we won the state championship again. And I was I was about six three then, and uh, weighed about 195. And, and uh, that was uh, one of my highlights, I guess, in, in high school because uh, I outscored the, the entire other team in the final game for the state championship. So I think I had something like 35 and they had 29 or something like The 1950s would prove to be the golden era of Allegheny County basketball with 10 boys state championship teams coming out of the Georges Creek Valley that decade. At that time, the Western Maryland Interscholastic League, the WMI for short, was one of the most powerful, competitive, and exciting athletic conferences in the state. Central High School of Lonaconing, led by legendary coach John Myers and star player Don McKenzie, won the Class B championships in 1950 and 1952. Well, it was pretty scary for somebody up there in Lonaconing to go down to the college park. That gym was so big, he was, felt like he was lost. We was Class B, Barton was Class C, and Bruce was Class B. So we had to compete with uh, Bruce to uh, go to the college park. Like I said, it was pretty scary for us young guys going down into Washington and all that. Area. We'd never been out of Coney before. At the same time that McKenzie was leading Central to Class B titles, Barton High School, coached by John Thomas and featuring brothers Bill and Bob Kirk, built a mini dynasty in Classification C, winning the championship in 1950, 1951, and 1953. The coach Kirk at Allegheny College, 
he's a coach that honestly, he could coach at high school, which he did. He could have coached at junior college, but he's also, I firmly believe this, he could have coached Division One college. He could have coached in the NBA. He's just one of those guys that has a personality and he can get people to do anything he wants them to do in the right way. And I honestly believe that he wanted, he could have coached Division One, or he could have coached in the NBA. And one of the good athletes that came out of Barton was a guy by the name of Bob Kirk, who went down to AC and, and coached. And uh, always said he was my idol. In a small town, where you know if you're if you were an athlete and interested in sports, you were in the right place because everybody in town was interested, and that's kind of what the whole town was about. And fortunately, uh, we had the only basket. Uh, in town that was behind our house and actually we started with a, a bucket like a five gallon paint bucket or a coal bucket they saw us shooting at that basket and they put a basket up for us that they had in the fire hall that they'd used the best basketball in the state of Maryland was played in Western Maryland in the 50s and when we got down to College Park uh, I couldn't play because the freshmen weren't eligible but I played every game up until that time as a matter of fact when we played in high school Barton was a very small gym, so they'd take the windows out, uh, the lower windows, you were right to the ground, and they'd let people stand there at the window and watch a game, and uh, because we couldn't get, couldn't nearly get everybody in the gym. Matter of fact, as a varsity player, we could go to the game and get a seat early. When they opened the gym, they let us in, so then when somebody came in to watch a game, we'd sell our seat. Then, in 1954, a huge change came to the Georges Creek area. That year, Barton and Central consolidated, forming the new Valley High School, located in Lonaconing. While that consolidation was taking place, Westernport star Dave Marble led Bruce High to two more Class B state titles in 1953 and 1954. The creation of Valley did little to curb the success of the athletes from Midland, Barton, and Lonaconing. Only a couple years after consolidating, George Lauder and several other Barton boys now aligned with Lona Koning's best players and coached by Central's John Myers, went on to win the Maryland Class B state championship in 1956, 1957, and 1959. We lost my junior year because some guy missed a layup. Of course, that guy was me. I don't remember a lot of shots during the games or during the year or during my career, but that always stuck in my mind. Uh, I can't remember the team that we were playing but it was supposed to be a team that we were supposed to beat very, very easily. And uh, we get down there and get down towards the end of the game. We were losing by two points. And we used what we called the three-man weave. That's where you just go back outside and go back and forth across the court. So we did that two or three times. I got the ball and I, and I saw an opening there. So I went in to shoot the layup. And I forgot to look at the basket, I think because I missed the, the rim, I hit the backboard, I missed the rim, and I think the ball came out all the way to the, to the foul line. So it was just one of those things, you know, you have a lot of good days, you have some bad days, and, and uh, it sticks with you for a while. As I say, Mr. Arnone still brings that up to me every once in a while, and, but it was great, you know, you gotta take the good with the bad. When Bruce High won yet another Class B title in 1961, it gave Western Allegheny County its 14th Boys Basketball State Championship in 13 years. From 1948 to 1961, a local basketball team won a state championship in all but three seasons, with multiple area teams achieving a victory in 1949, 1950, and 1953. This era of success by five high schools only a few miles apart is unrivaled in Maryland's basketball history. Several years later, after former All-WMI players Bob Kirk, George Lauder, and Dave Marple joined forces at nearby Frostburg State University, Kirk took over as head basketball coach at Mount Savage High School. In 1967, Kirk led the Indians to the Class C State Championship game where they won an exciting victory 56-54. Decades after his first state championships as the coach of Central and Valley High Schools in the 1950s, John Myers guided the 1979 Valley team featuring star guard David Hobel to the Class C state title. 
That year, the Black Knights went 26-0, becoming the only team in Maryland history to do so. The big thing about that game is uh, we were down, we actually get down, and we didn't press that much, we came back and we pressed. And so then the game came down to tie game with like 12 seconds left, and uh, I dribbled in. I was just so fortunate enough that I hit a shot and went in, and uh, we won the States. My goodness, it was usually crowded, and I know when Coach Hobell played at Valley, I mean, those people were lined out on almost to the main road trying to get into the gym. And once the gym would get filled, they would come out and just stand in the lobby and look through the doors to, to the, for the game. What I would do, actually, I would leave a window open in the locker room, and uh, then I would take a trash can and bring it over, put the trash can up, climb up through the window, get through, then I have to come back around, leave the door open, take the trash can, remove it, and then go back into the gym. And what I found out in the gym, I could, they had this uh, one light switch that left two little lights on. So I could get in there and uh, turn the lights on and go in there and uh, shoot. And then one day I think I found out my coach realized what I was doing because I went to leave the window unlocked and all of a sudden it was already unlocked. He said, I've already taken care of that for you. Now, here's something I've never told anyone. And, uh, my mom and dad don't even know this. My dad worked cat eye 11 to 7 at night. So I'd go to sleep, my mom go to sleep. I'd actually get up sometimes maybe 2 or 3 in the morning, go to Valley, climb through the window, go in there and shoot for an hour, come back home, and then uh, get up in the morning and go to school. So that's something no one knew. I kept that a secret for 50, uh, how old, 51 years. What, what's neat about my coach, coach my dad also. So my dad won a state title in the 50s. And then we want to stay tight on the 70s. Basketball is uh, one sport my dad got me into when I was young. It's the best thing about basketball, I could just go play and I need a basketball and a hoop and that's why I chose basketball. There's this kid named Steve Vinside and the best thing that ever happened was he got blacktop. Back then when you played on the basketball courts, you, and I think I actually helped my dribble, you played on grass and dirt. Well, he gets blacktop. Steve Vince, I, he had this basket in his uh, basement, and I had mine. And me and him, when the NBA Finals would start, we'd run NBA Finals ourselves, and we would play. Two years later, the 1981 Valley team, Myers' final squad, again won the championship in Classification C. That state title was the seventh of John Myers' career. His tenure at Central and Valley lasted 34 years and included over 400 victories. Known as a calm, thoughtful coach, Meyer was a mentor and an inspiration to the hundreds of young men he coached. After the consolidation of Valley and Bruce in the Westmore High School, the 1990s Wildcat teams coached by Rick Scaletta had significant success against their local rivals. My dad uh, taught myself and my three other brothers the game of basketball. Uh, my dad was a tremendous teacher. Um, one of the heroes of Westmore High School athletics, James Max Sloan, capped off his remarkable basketball career in Lonaconing on January 13, 1995. That night, in a home game against arch rival Allegheny High School, Max scored 66 points, setting the school record and leading his team to a historic victory. Your fan base is always uh, great, and it was that way when I had Bo Evans. Uh, and the team that I had in 89 to 90. If you didn't get there early, you weren't getting in. The same way it was with Max Sloan, you couldn't get in if you weren't there early. Probably the second fondest memory I had was my first year up at uh, Westmar when we, uh, Bruce and Valley consolidated in uh, 1986 or 87. I went up there 89 and had uh, a real group of uh, kids that uh, worked hard. Their ethics were uh, tremendous and probably the best player that I probably ever coached is your vice principal, Bo Evans. Um, you know, the, there was a, a long-standing rivalry between Bruce and Valley um, that, that went way back. It was always very heated, particularly when it came to basketball. That was the big one because it always seemed like Bruce and Valley played um, in the regional playoffs and it usually you know, it determined who from our region went to the state tournament. The Crick schools were always top dogs in basketball in the area. But if you had a good team, the gym was packed. 
Winter sports have long been a source of great pride to the students, faculty, and alumni of Western Allegheny County High Schools. Wrestling, indoor track and field, unified bocce ball, and basketball have not only rich local histories, but exciting futures. Finally, the snow is melting and the grass is starting to grow. Spring has arrived. Now, we transition from the hard court inside to the fields, tracks, and courts outside. And for spring sports athletes, March 1st is a day that is greatly anticipated. Filled with an indescribable energy, the athletes suit up for the first day of practice in the 2014 spring season. The Mount Ridge District has seen a countless amount of success in spring sports, including a baseball hall of famer, a major league pitching coach, a starting first baseman for the 1970 world champion Pittsburgh Pirates, numerous state champions from Mount Savage, Westmore, Valley, and Bruce High Schools, more recent back-to-back -back state softball champions, and a quartet of girls track state champions. Our region has thrived in athletics for generations and has developed not only a reputation, but an expectation of success and class. Dan DeWitt, a member of the 2004 and 2005 Bell High School track and field team, remembers what drew him to track and field and highlights exactly why he thinks other people participate in the sport. Running still seems to have the same sense of camaraderie and, and friendship that drew me to it initially and I think probably continues to draw kids to it. And whether it's because this area is so rich in running tradition or, or whatever, I think kids continue to get drawn to it because there has been so much success in the past. And I think kids see that their friends are, are going out and after a year or two of hard training, they're winning state titles. And I think that really brings a lot of kids into the sport because then they can be a part of something that isn't impossible. And it, it really it really brings the, the realness of it back home. And I think that, that draws a lot of kids to it. it. It's a fun way to spend your time and a fun way to make friends doing something that you all kind of enjoy doing and you know, I think the more success this area continues to have the more kids are going to want to get into it because it is really a, a self-rewarding sport the more you put into it the more you're going to get out of it and that sounds pretty cliche but that's really really true for running so. Norm DeRosa, coach of the track and field team at Mount Ridge High School recounts past victories and how his kids have inspired other teams to raise the bar and how experience and time has made him a better coach. Uh, you know, state championships are great. I mean, what an achievement. But, you know, sometimes a lot of those kids that stand out are just those kids that maybe had the greatest work ethic in the world, but they could never achieve that championship. You know, we've, we've had some great ones over the years. The first one that comes to mind is Will Vaughtman. Uh, he had a teammate, him and Ray Race. Uh, they were both shot and disc guys. I think Will was better in the shot, Ray was better in the disc. That, their senior years, they were both state champions. So that was really nice and so inspiring to see how hard these uh, young kids work. Uh, it's just amazing. Um, we would do 400 meter repeats. Inevitably, they could quit whenever they wanted to. But I would have kids do 25. I think the record is like 26 400 meter repeats and it's just because they don't want to stop. They just push themselves. That's how hard they work. I think over the years I've become more knowledgeable about how to train and what works and what doesn't work. And, and you know, each kid is individual. What works for one might not work for another one. You know, that, that's what I kind of enjoy the most is seeing the kids just get so excited about it and, you know, it's part of their life. I've just been very fortunate to have just great kids come into the program, buy into it, and work extremely hard. Alan Twig, a wrestling and track coach for Mountain Ridge High School, explains why he became a track coach and the amazing dedication of the athletes in the program. The reason why I started track was uh, uh, my daughter uh, ran track. The first year that I coached her as a junior, they placed second in the state in the four by eight. Uh, and then the following year, the same group of girls placed third in the state in the 4x8. And they had some other, you know, they had placed in the 4x4, and uh, she placed individually in the, in the Open 800 in the state. They kind of set the foundation, I guess you would say, for uh, the girls that I have now. 
you know, uh, Alex Nepper, uh, Madison Ofstein, Eric Wells, and Casey Felker, those four girls won the state championship in the four by eight. They have uh, some of the best work ethic and of any, any uh, group of people that I've coached. You know, when you run, your body needs some downtime. Uh, so you have, you know, two or three days where you really work as hard as what you can and say, okay, now, you know, it's time to take a day off. Let's just, let's just have an easy day. Well, they don't know what an easy day is. In 2013, the Mount Ridge 4x800 meter relay team of Alex Nepper, Casey Felker, Erica Wilson, and Madison Ofstein won the state championship. The junior members of that team take us into the mind of an athlete after they realize they just accomplished the goal they've been working towards all season. I remember our sophomore year when we first started training hard and thought we were going to do it. Um, like We kept breaking school records and our time kept dropping every, every meet. But then last year, it wasn't like that. It was different. Like We weren't dropping and dropping. It was kind of like plateauing. And then all of a sudden we got to States and it was like we dropped crazy amounts of time and we like broke the 1A record and really broke the 2A record and we beat all classifications all their times. So it was just insane. Yeah, um, we dropped actually probably like 23 seconds from our fastest time of the year to States. So we were kind of like, well shoot, where'd that come from? <laughs> I was, I was on cloud nine. I was so happy. Um, I couldn't believe we'd, we'd done it because it was like almost like the process is just as good as getting there. Like all the anticipation, all of our expectations, um, all of the training, just imagining the Western Tech girls in front of us. They're not going to beat us. Um, it was just like we did it. I just think this whole experience has like taught me to never give up on anything because just like falling at Southern or losing by a split second, it teaches you to come back and you can do anything if you try and work really hard. During 2012 and 2013, the Mountain Ridge Lady Miner softball team won a back-to-back -back championship with a 64 game winning streak. The team worked together to achieve what has not been achieved before. The dedication and commitment of these girls allowed them to accomplish the unimaginable. The group of girls that we had that year, we'd been playing together since we were like eight and nine years old. So as soon as we started the season, we knew that we had a good team and it would probably turn out really well. It was kind of always in the backs of our minds. We knew we had the right things together. We worked well as a team and we knew we were going to go far. And just like the memories and the bonds with these people, like that's the most important thing that I'm going to take away. Like, yeah, I've learned a lot of like lessons and, mm -hmm. but like trophies will just fade and like my softball ability will definitely decrease, but I'll always have the memories from those games. Their teammate, Katie Llewellyn, had been diagnosed with leukemia. Chelsea and Jenna explained how her role in the team changed and the support the whole team gave to Katie. She had come home for one year after her transplant and she mm -hmm. went four for four in the state game. And Well, you could definitely tell the first year she obviously couldn't play. She had to wear a mask and she came to all of our practices and games and you can tell she was just itching to be on the field. And We made every single game for her. Yeah, we wore I mean. orange wristbands with her number on it and headbands and stuff. And uh, even though she wasn't playing, she was still very much part of the team. And the second year, we definitely, she definitely came back with a fire in her, and she had an amazing season. Joe Carter is a former assistant principal at Mountain Ridge High School and the former baseball coach for Mount Savage, who won the championships in 1986 and 1993. Here, he outlined some of the differences between how baseball teams were set up then, as opposed to how they are now, and reminisces on the importance of teamwork, the importance of staying focused on one game at a time, and, most importantly, believing in yourself and your team. 1986 and 1993 are the two years that we won the state championships. 
1985, we got to the Final Four, and we lost in the semifinals. Um, and then in 1994, we lost in the finals. 1986 was played at McCurdy Field in Frederick. Uh, we won 4-3. We scored the winning run in the bottom of the seventh. There were seven seniors on that team who had all been there the year before, so they knew what it took. We also had a freshman playing shortstop. So that was the interesting thing that, that we did in those days, that if it was a freshman or a sophomore really good, they ended up playing varsity because we didn't have a JV team. We didn't have that many kids. In 93, uh, the score was 7-4. to four. We played at McCurdy Field also. It got close in the middle innings, but we dominated the game. We had 14 hits. Uh, everyone in the lineup had a hit. And we just basically, um, we get up 3 nothing, and, and again, there were seven seniors started on that team, and there was a freshman catcher. So it was the same type, type of scenario. In, in 86, we were, um, what, 18-3, in um, 93, we were 19-3. and three. So it was uh, a lot of similarities. You know, there were seven years apart, there were seven seniors on each team, and uh, records were really similar. In 1993, we had to go to Clear Spring to play in a regional final in order to get to the States. And they had a pitcher down there that was undefeated and had only given up six runs for the entire year. So we had to beat him to get to the States. And we ended up beating them like 11 to seven and uh, had three home runs, scored more runs off of him than we had, than he had given up all year. And I can remember saying, well, this team hit the ball so well that it didn't make any difference who was gonna throw against us. And Coach Brunswick came over and said he'd never seen a high school team hit the ball like we did. And that wasn't an accident, these guys well, you know, we had the net, we had the pitching machine, and they would just wear it out. I'd, I'd, I'd have to throw them out of, of the gym because that's all they wanted to do. And the 93 team was probably the best team that I had ever coached. All nine of them hit 300 or above. Uh, they could just flat out play. And Jeremy was probably... Um, if I would have to rank all the players I've coached over the years, probably one of the best hitters I had ever coached. I could definitely put him in the top three. He was, he was an amazing player. Jeremy Kennel, a member of the 1993 Mount Savage baseball team, gives a look at how community support impacts the team and how playing together since Little League is a big advantage. Through the years we played on a Little League growing up, Pony leg, and just when we got to high school, I mean, we had a powerhouse. I mean, there wasn't no team around here that would compare to us. I would say winning the state championship was probably the best memory. Plus, having fire trucks coming back after we won, they lined up from Spurls the whole way to Mount Savage, followed us, followed the bus the whole way up to Savage, with fire, sirens and all that stuff going on. It was good. I mean, it was real good down there. A lot of our fans went down. I mean, there was we had a pile of people down there, and actually on the way down, a couple of the people actually stopped our bus, and down through Corganville, they had a sign that said "Go Indians." They actually stopped our bus and jumped out in front of the bus. They slowed us down, and there's probably a thousand people standing along the white line wishing us well as we went. It was big at Mount Savage, and it was a, that community thing. And, and any time uh, in a small community that you could do something like that, it just brought the entire community together. The Mountain Ridge baseball team won the state championship in 2012. Josh Van Meter, a member of the team, worked hard to help his team achieve this goal. By, by that Somerset tournament, we were brothers. There was nothing between us. We had one common goal, and there was nothing that was going to get in our way, whether it was an opponent, whether it was weather, whether it was an official, whether it was another coach. We didn't care. We had to be so good that we didn't chance it. We wanted it so bad, and that's what we did. You know, we pride ourselves in solid defense, 
whether it was infield or outfield, uh, we could count on each other to give full 110% effort on every single pitch, every play, every day. You know, it was, it was that level of respect for one another and just knowing, hey, I got your back. In that next 30 to 40 minutes with that team on that field celebrating and getting the awards and just seeing your coach cry, seeing your coach just feel that relief of we did it, we made it, we are the best in the state. That's what, that's what you work for. That's the reason I play, to win. You know, it's fun playing a sport. A lot of people say, let's play for fun. When you get to this level, let's win. You know, we don't put all that work in for nothing. And uh, to see a reward after all that hard work, buddy, there's nothing like it. I mean, it was an amazing run. The way the community just just got on our back and went with us, uh, I'll never forget it. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to play for Mountain Ridge under Coach O'Neill, um, for this community. Um, Frostburg's community means more to me than anyone I think will ever know. The, um, the pride they put on my back and the respect they gave me, I owe it back to them. Bobby Robertson former Mount Savage baseball player, prophesizes about his time with the Pittsburgh Pirates, what he remembers most from his time in the majors, and the injury that was the beginning of the end for his career. used to pick up rocks and hit them with my bat, and I'd pretend I was Mickey Mantle or Ernie Banks or, or, or the guys that I kind of saw on television. I had that bat for a long time, and I don't know where it went, but there wasn't much left of it after hitting all them rocks and stuff like that. When I went to Forbes Field one time, Leon Connors, a good friend of ours down in Mount Savage, took Ralph Wilson and I to see a ball game in Forbes Field. I'll never forget, I leaned over to Ralph and I said, you know, Ralph, I'm going to play there one of these days. And then a few short years later, I'm in the same clubhouse, sitting on the same bench, and when we run out on the field, Clemente was running out here beside me. Stargell was running out here beside me. And I go to first, he goes to right, and Willie goes to left. There at Forbes Field, you could smell the uh, steel mill, the smoke that come out up there and stuff like that. In Forbes Field, you could smell the hot dogs, you know, and you could see the pigeons and stuff flying around they had there. But it was so much history in Forbes Field where Babe Ruth played, stood the same place I did. I so I went up to the, when I went to the American League, when I went to Yankee Stadium, the first thing I did was walk out in the left center and look at the monuments back there, the Mantles and, and the DiMaggio's and all that. I seen where Mantle hit that ball out, out, almost out of the stadium. That was a long ways. And there I stood at the same place that Babe Ruth and all the great Lou Gehrig played. And, uh, you know, and there I was right there at home plate. And we was playing a game in Chicago. It was a game of the week. Tony Kubek and I can't remember the other guy's name. But anyway, Ron Sano, the third baseman, he'll pop up over towards our dugout. And I went over to get that because I pretty much caught everything I could get to. And I went over and, the, and my leg, this leg right here, slipped in that mud hole. And I said, wow, something going on here. So I'm back out to play first base, and I could feel my pants get tight. Here my knees start swelling up. They called the game, and I went up to the trainer's room, the Tardy Broner room. The trainer says, what's wrong with your knee? I said, oh, no, Tony. Stepped in a mud hole out there. And, well, that's when it all started. Then from that time on, let's see, I had three knee operations, two back surgeries, one kidney operation, one broken nose, and one broken wrist. I've done a lot of things in, in baseball nobody else has ever done. Playoffs, records. I hit four home runs in the playoffs, three in one game against San Francisco. World Series, I hit two. So that was pretty neat. You look in the record books, I'm in there right underneath the Babe Ruth or some of the stuff. You know? So that's, that's pretty neat. This little thing on my finger right here is a World Series ring. Uh, there's a lot of great ball players that never. Never got one of these. But a little old uh, red-headed boy from Mount Savage, I got one. Ken Metz gives a story about the recruitment of Robert Moses Grove, better known as Lefty from Lonico. 
Uh, Lefty Grove uh, was being uh, scouted by the Baltimore Orioles. Baltimore Orioles was a minor league team back then. And Baltimore sent uh, to Lone Coning uh, a uh, scout to sign a contract with Lefty to come and play ball in Baltimore. The scout arrives in Lone Coning, knocks on the door of the Grove house. Lefty's mom answers, and the scout says, I'm here to sign your son. Here's the paper. And the mother says, well, Lefty's off in the woods hunting squirrels. So he'll be back. Uh, in a couple minutes, why don't you just sit on the front porch and wait for him? So the scout sits on the front porch and waits, and Lefty finally comes down off the hill with a string of squirrels on his shoulder that he had just killed, and he gets onto the porch, and the scout introduces himself. He says, oh, I see you've been hunting squirrels. Uh, where's, your, where's your rifle? Lefty, you know, fastball, fireball pitcher says, I, I'm a sporting man, so uh, I, I, I give them a chance. I just throw rocks at them. And the scout is impressed as heck, you know, that someone can hit a little squirrel with a rock from a certain distance. And, and the scout says, uh, you're a sporting man. Uh, uh, yes, Lefty said, I'm such a sporting man that I only throw at him with my right hand. Now that's the local legend in Lone Coning the, of the famous left-handed fastball pitcher who uses his other hand to kill, to kill the squirrels. Dorothy Thompson, Lefty's niece, explains why he stayed so long in the minors, his amazing achievements in his first year in the majors, and how he broke the stereotype of the typical Western Marylander. When I was a little girl, I don't think I realized he was a famous baseball player. I always called him Uncle Bob. Um, I think Jack Dunn was the owner of the Orioles and had heard about him playing in Martinsburg and went to play for the Orioles. And like I said, they were a minor league team, the International League, I think is what they called it. I know he played for the Orioles for a long time. Um, the major leagues wanted him, but Jack Dunn who was the owner of the team, you know, they were winning. They were uh, champions, so I don't think he wanted to part with Lefty. Stock market crashed in 1929, and he was, tr uh, the Philadelphia athletic team was owned by Connie Mack, too, I think, and he had to start selling all his stars off because if people weren't coming to the ballparks, they didn't have any money, so he was sold to the Boston Red Sox and went to play there. 1931 was the first year the MVP award was issued and he won 30 games. No pitcher has ever beaten that record. He didn't like to talk to reporters because he didn't feel comfortable. He didn't have as much education as they did. Um, and they called him illiterate and couldn't speak because he came from, you know, the backwater, bad little backwater town in Western Maryland. So uh, he didn't talk to reporters a lot. And I guess it's just like today, if uh, players don't talk to the media, you know, they're considered standoffish. So I think he got that reputation. He would be known to go to the Little League game, someone didn't have a bat, he'd just give them one of his bats to play or his glove to play with. And I think he sponsored Little League teams, bought all their equipment. Um, baseball's changed a lot from, from the time when Lefty played till when I was growing up to now. Um, players didn't switch teams. They were signed by a team and they stayed with that team almost their whole careers. And of course now they don't do that. They go where the money is the, the best. It's hard to have a baseball hero when they keep switching teams. In all sports, competitors, coaches, and traditions are constantly evolving to match the ever-changing world around them. The equipment used, rules followed, and even the mentalities with which sports are approached has changed dramatically over the last century. Our conditioning now today, they, they condition uh, probably the whole year round. You have youth leagues you play in, you have summer leagues you play in. We had none of that. We just simply, as I said, two months a year, it's the only time we ever saw a soccer ball. We would go out and play. It was a good time back then. I mean, <laughs> thinking about it, life was a little simpler and it wasn't as much, of, you know, like the internet and all that to occupy people's times and you know was, I guess those were the good old days as they say. <laughs> Got to live some of them. I guess the sports themselves haven't changed. It's the uh, attendance that type of thing I think has changed because of the uh, way people live today. I mean back 
in this time, uh, some of the pictures in the book, if you look at the stands, the stands are full. But that was before there was a mall. That was before we, we didn't even have a shopping center until 1970. And it was a G.C. Murphy's and uh, a food land. People's lifestyles were different, you know. And now, you know, Friday evening, half the people go to the mall, half of them go to the movie, half of them go someplace else. I think the biggest, the biggest thing is now sports are year round. Not that they weren't, you know, not that I, when I wrestled, I, not that I what, didn't go to wrestling camp and do some, do some, uh, uh, you know, training on the off season. But now, I mean, I mean, we start wrestling uh, November fifteenth, and it ends the first week of March. Uh, we take a week off after that, and then we're back in the, in the weight room uh, lifting. I have probably at least a third to maybe a half of my team that travels uh, to uh, Johnstown and Altoona and Latrobe and wrestle on club teams in Pennsylvania, you know, year round. I mean, they're going, they're traveling, you know, an uh, hour and a half to two hours, two days a week, you know, nearly every day, you know, every week of the, of the year. And I think all sports are doing, you know, have to do that. You know, we lifted back when, when, when I was playing sports. Uh, now, you know, not everybody did it. Now it's mandatory. If you don't, you're not gonna, you're probably not even gonna, you know, uh, be on the team unless you have some kind of exceptional natural ability or something. But, uh, you know, it's, it's become a, uh, a year round thing. I still encourage, uh, you know, people to, you know, athletes to be involved in more than one sport, you know, it's, it's still, it's still necessary to, you know, to be a two or three sport athlete if, if you have the ability to do that. Uh, and most of those sports will help train you for, you know, whatever your, you know, uh, your other sports that you participate in. You know, we're not a, we're, you know, we're not a large school, but we're not a small school either, but the smaller schools, uh, you know, uh, you almost have to have people compete in, in, uh, in more than one sport. But the bigger schools, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, bigger schools, you see people that are now they they're concentrating on one sport year round. Um, so I think that part of it has changed because back when I, you know, when I was in school, pretty much everybody was in at least two or three sports. Thinking about it, there's more organized sports than there was when I was growing up. Now, for the most part, when the legs are formed, an adult forms a leg, and they have their own rules. Where back then we sort of ran our own legs. I mean, we'd play, we'd get down to the meadow, had a ball field, we'd get down there and play, run our baseball leg through that. But we did a lot of things on our own and formed our own leagues and kept standings and kept records of most home runs, most goals, most, it's just amazing some of the, the things that we did looking back that as kids, we just did that on our own. Sports back then, it was great. I mean, we always used to joke, we were like the Beatles of the 70s. You know how the Beatles of the 60s, everyone was crazy over the Beatles? We used to always joke and say, we're the Beatles of the 70s. Because it didn't matter where we went or uh, whatever, people treated us just like, we always said, we're, we're like the Beatles. You'd go to a game at, at Valley. The games back then didn't start to eight. Well, people would start standing in line at four o'clock just to get into the game. I mean, you, we'd be leaving to go home from school and there'd be lines already forming to get into the gym. People had to sit along the sidelines just to watch the game. It's unreal how the community just forward to sports. I don't know if the intensity is there today in, in, in kids is as much as it was back in the mid 80s, late 80s, early 90s. I, I just think kids today, and this is just my personal opinion, I, I just think kids today have so many other things to do. Um, they have video games, they have their license, they have their car, they go, uh, they want to do this with their friends or they want to do that. A small school, and I'm going to take Westmar for example, a, a small school like Westmar, you have a uh, athlete, and I had some great ones, uh, Mr. Evans, <clears throat> like I said, uh, Max Sloan, I had a kid, Bobby Alcar. There is a boy, and he is the only kid in, in the history of Allegheny County that has made the all area first team in three sports his senior year. He did it in basketball, he did it in football, he did it in baseball. We use him as an example. Here's a, a young man coming from a small school. They need those, they need his athletic ability in the other sports. I'm gonna take Allegheny and Fort Hill for an example. Now, here's a, a, a kids that have gone through Allegheny and Fort Hill. I've always told my uh, kids, and they played two sports, basketball and baseball, pick one sport and go with it. I don't want you to get burned out. And I think this is what happens with kids now coming from Pee Wee 
all the way up to high school. I think by the time they get to high school, they burn out, and they don't want to have that work ethic anymore. You know, and I know some, the small schools, and let me go back to Westmore. Uh, the small schools they need that they need that athlete. The game is changing every year, and especially when they put the three point line in, you had to go out and, and guard the perimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, when I coached and everything, we didn't have to guard the, the perimeter because of the three point line. We kind of packed it in and made them beat you from the outside. But kids today, shooters today, you can't do that. You got to go out and defend. Uniform wise, uh, officials, you can't wear this and you can't wear that and everything. It, it, it certainly has changed and everything. And it's going to keep changing. Everybody in town was involved. And uh, no matter what you were doing athletically, any sport, Barton, George's Creek, I mean, Monaconi, Westernport, uh, Frostburg. Uh, it was all about sports. However, both in Western Allegheny County and beyond, one constant in sports that has stood the test of time is the impact athletics has on people once they leave the field or gym. Sports, especially at the high school level, instilled in the men and women featured in this documentary a powerful appreciation for dedication, perseverance, and sportsmanship. There were only a handful of the thousands of young student athletes that put on their school's uniform and competed against one another while learning lessons that would stay with them forever. For many of our interviewees and the countless athletes that came before and after them, sports provided an outlet for the obstacles and challenges they faced in their personal lives. Norm DeRosa's emotional return to coaching following the tragic loss of his daughter, Katie Llewellyn's heroic defeat of cancer in the midst of an incredible softball career, and numerous other stories highlight the deep and profound meaning sports hold for so many people. Despite the constant evolution of athletics, the one unifying and permanent factor to sports is that, to a young men and women who devote their blood, sweat, and tears into becoming better at what they do, athletics will always be more than a game.